Hello, I'm Michael Schaefer. Welcome to the Poetry Exchange. It's great to be back after a little break with the latest edition of the podcast that celebrates poems as friends. Those of you that tune in regularly will know we've shifted to a slightly longer gap between episodes and we're now putting one out into the world once a month. If you're new to the podcast, do have a look and a listen at the previous episodes where you'll find conversations about poems by some of the most well-known poets of the past and present, as well as some poems that might be new to you. We're busy gathering more conversations at the moment and editing them for you, so make sure you've pressed subscribe on your podcast to get each episode as it comes along. Thanks to all those of you that have been in touch and said lovely things about the podcast, and indeed to those of you that have given us a review on iTunes. If you are enjoying listening um, and feel moved to do so, please head on over to iTunes where you can give us a rating. It really does help us to reach out to more people. This month's episode was recorded in the Poetry Library. Our thanks to them for hosting, and you'll be hearing Alistair Snell and Sarah Saldway in conversation with our visitor Martin. And many thanks to him for agreeing to let us share the conversation with you. You may well have guessed from the title which poem this episode features. It's probably one of the most famous poems in the English language. It is The Lake Isle of Innisfree by W.B. Yeats, the poem that's been a friend to Martin. I will arise and go now, and go to Innisfree, and a small cabin built there of clay and bottles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings, there midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always, night and day, I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore, while I stand on the roadway, or on the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core. Mm, That's beautifully read. Wonderful, thank you. I'd love to know when you first came across it, Martin. I first came across it when I was 17 or 18, and I was doing A-level English. And one of the poems was this one. Uh, We were studying Yeats, and we were studying it with a lovely Welsh English teacher, Mrs Griffiths, who liked to be known as Marm, who used to hold court with six or seven of us who were in the class, all boys. And it was my introduction to poetry, really. It was, uh, I, I had read poetry before, of course, and dipped in in various ways, but it opened a whole new world, I think, of uh, sense, imagination, and romance in a way. So that was my first encounter with it. Would Mrs. Griffiths read poems <laughs> to you? Or did oh, you yes. <laughs> she would read, and she did have a wonderful Welsh mellifluous voice, yeah. and we had to hold court and listen to Mom reading. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then she would get us to read. Uh, and, and I think it, it, that helped us discover the musicality of it, the, which is in here, the, the rhythms and the beauty of sound, which goes with this, I think, to some degree. As well as discovering, I think, a distinct Irish voice, which is part of it for me. My family is mostly Irish, so I, as a child, always holidayed in the west of Ireland and have gone back since. So it holds something about Ireland for me, which is bound up with all sorts of memories, actually, yeah. of, of childhood and my mother, of, of going back and rediscovering a very special place for me. Did it make an impression on you then, or was it later? It was actually later. I, I think for me there's something about a, a poem as a friend being a, a constant rediscovery mm. and it acquires different resonances and uh, meaning as you, as you read it. So even just over the last few days picking it up again, the rediscovery was about the fact this is about two places. It's not just about the Lake of Innisfree. It's about the roadway and the pavement's grey and the yearning from a place like this to this place of tranquillity. And, and that was the rediscovery for me. So every time I read it, there's another dimension to it or another powerful uh, connection. And, and that, for me, really resonates right now because I'm desperate to go away on holiday and I think be somewhere <laughs> like this. <laughs> you talked about romance, which mm. was interesting with this. I mean, do, would you just say a little more about that? As... I think I have a romanticised view of Ireland 
and I think Irish literature has a quite romanticised view of itself, really. But there's something in it that's quite tangible for me in terms of memory and experience. Would you say a little bit about those holidays? Do yeah, I do. I um, There were just three of us siblings then, and we would pack into my mum's friend's mini and drive out from West London for what felt like forever, and it was forever, three grumpy kids in the back sea crossing across to the South of Ireland and then end up in Mallow County Cork and staying in, in the family house which was still lived in at the time by my uncle and we just used to, well we had a lot of freedom, we, we went out the back to where there was a beautiful salmon river and yes it was an idyll in my youth and I go back there now and, and where there's a beautiful, car, where there was a beautiful castle and, and a deer park but it was, it, it was a restful time, it was a, yeah. a time for being a child and because I, you know, I grew up in the city in West London it was a time of being in the country and of skimming stones and mm-hmm. catching fish. I think in my mind's eye it was a simpler time, yeah. a time of being a child and time also being really spoiled. I mean, the Irish are great with kids. You know, everywhere we went, we had money pressed in your hand and you just treat it in a different way. Um, so I loved it. You said every time you've read it, you've seen something mm. different. Are there any particular lines that strike you or the need that you love? I love the rhythms of it. I'm not sure I quite fully get them or capture them, but there's a real sense of the rhythm of the voice taking you through. You said about your mother, is, that, is it that they're an echo of her? Voice? Yeah, I do associate Ireland with a gentleness and a kindness of spirit that was expressed in the voice yeah. and with other people I knew of her generation. And there wasn't a harshness with it. There was a kind of reverence for that ease of conversation of being with people and a gentle mannered way, which was particular to her, her family, so forth. But uh, it's something I really treasure as a memory. I love the B loud glade, just the, mm. <laughs> the fun of that, because it gets you listening. Mm, There's no such really. thing as complete silence, yeah. really. There's always something going on. But that's a something that's very um, calming. It really caught me the roadway and the pavement's grey this time. that he ca- mm. And mm. it comes in at the end, it just sneaks up. Mm. And then you suddenly realise that, yes, most of the time we're not in that wonderful, peaceful place. We're living elsewhere, we're li- leading busy lives. And this is a place that we want to be in and, and try and wish ourselves into, really. So you said when you, you came across it first of all when you were 17, Martin, yeah. and, and then discovered it later on. Was it at a particular time you kind of, it started to mean something? Uh, yeah, but the one, fairly recently I went on, I go on silent retreats just this time of year to get away and declutter and, and be somewhere quiet. But I did take some poetry with me and this was one of the poems I took and I actually memorised it. And I'm not quite sure why, but it was a time of rediscovering poetry for myself. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't say poetry has always been something I read, but I've returned to it more and more as I get older. And it, it brought back those connections that I've spoken about, but that sense also of voicing them, mm-hmm. of not just reading but voicing, bringing those qualities into my life. And I think that's what a good poem can do. I think it can bring that world you're fond of in reading it or reading, or not even reading it aloud. It can enter into you again. Mm-hmm. And that's quite important, I think, when, when you have a lot of your life being completely swept up with all sorts of other things. I've been going on retreats for a long time as an adult and more recently as part of my faith and spiritual development, but also that's intimately connected to retaining my heart in what it is that I'm doing and uh, returning to what's important and what I value. What, what, what do you think Yates is saying here? There's something about building a home which I think I quite respond to. Recently I've grown more and more fond of gardening as well, which I think is all connected to making that home for oneself, which isn't just about the four walls, it's about the spiritual home and and a peaceful place. And I like that little buildingness about it. And and I'll have nine bean rows. (laughs) You know, he's thought about this. But the clay and wattles made, yes, it's... um, it's a romanticised little thing, but it's also very specific. I think it's about making it, but there's a tending to it. There's a care that goes with it, and the hive for the honeybee. There's something that isn't just about doing nothing. There's something about a, a nurture to this. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't take it as all whimsy, by any means, or all romanticised, or all necessarily about spirituality. I think there's something quite practical about yeah. 
these places don't just happen. You have to go and actually plan it and do it. And that, that I really kind of like to work with, that actually to have that, you've got to create it. And it's some piece, isn't it? There's acknowledgement from what you've said that it's not just endless days, mm. but there's... Mm. It's the bit in between as well. Yeah, and because the person, the poet, is in the roadway and the pavement's grey, there's the sense that, well, of course, that, it can't be all like that. Yeah. So the sum piece is, is, is perhaps partial, but that's a very important place. If, if you could sort of picture what sort of friend it, it is. Ah, there's always a constant, I think, with a good poem and one you love, coming back to this idea of rediscovery, now we're going into the future. It, it just appeals to a little pipe dream, definitely, that I have. But one I think I'd love to do, which is to, not now, but when, I'm saying this publicly for the first time, when I retire, which would be not for an, at least another 10 years, but I want to actively plan around it, would be to make a garden. I want to make a space which isn't just about me and this little retirement thing for me and whoever. Whoever <laughs> is the unfortunate person who may or may not end up sharing that space with me, but something, <laughs> something more, um, more public, I think, more uh, a, a, to actually build a place of peace. Which, and I think, and this is a kind of recent thing, trying to connect things up, that a garden would be really, really part of that. So actually, to build a garden that has that dimension to it, and there's loads of examples that fit around. There's some really lovely things happening in terms of actively building those spaces. So it inspires me around that. It's also tied up against this idea of practicality to actually mm-hmm. think about doing that. It's mm-hmm. okay. What, what are the nine yeah. nine beam poles, and what do I actually have mm-hmm. to do in terms of clay and model? So the practicality is really important, isn't I, as, it? Yes, because to ha- have that beauty, it, it, and that's that's in here. And again, I'm sure you would have that understanding that to create something of that nature, it's the planning, it's the the foundation, mm-hmm. it's the structure, it's it's all of that, which we know from other walks of life, and it's the same for this. It's not a place of just lie back and do nothing all the time. It's, a, it's an active thing. And do you find yourself already planning this? I would love to have more time to do it. Right now, I, I'm so preoccupied with one or two projects. At the same time, when I think of it, little things come into my mind, so projects that I've done or funded before, I think, oh, right, that will, that will be a little way to do that. Is it something you imagine doing by yourself? Because this sounds quite a solitary thing. It's, it is, yeah. I mean, that sort of delves into that project and where I want to be. But no, actually, I think to build something of the scale of my imagination, it, it can't just be a solo thing. But the, I think there's something also about... He does talk about living alone, but it doesn't exclude mm-hmm. the possibilities of other people. But I think for me, the living alone is resonates because I think the foundation for me of a spiritual practice is around solitude or at least partial solitude uh, of creating that space Mm -hmm. as a as a starting point and the making of that is really important and just rereading Finding Sanctuary by um, Abbot Jameson who who was the Benedictine who uh, did the reality TV program The Monastery but he wrote this book which is actually hugely practical about the Benedictine rule and how it's built up out of various practices but the cornerstone is is silence and some amount of solitude is necessary for that but again that is the prelude possibly to a very social active mm-hmm. life it's, but it was interesting that you picked up about the sound and I was just wondering the senses that you notice in life generally I think there's a rediscovery again as one gets older of of life but through nature that, that I, I don't think I valued nature in when I was 20, 30, anything like I do now. I was very much a town person, etc. But the rediscovery of nature and walking and, and lots of things I do now that I didn't do 20 years ago and, and uh, are really roots into um, all the things I've been speaking about, the, this, this world of tranquility, calm, and being with people, just walking through the countryside like it was yesterday in, in Sussex, just looking out for things, watching things, observing the changes, which I think, I know lots of people I think who value that more and more as they get older, it becomes a really, really important part of, of, of life, something to really value and treasure. So this takes me into that, it yeah, reminds me of that. Yeats says there, for always night and day I hear, as if he's hearing it more and more, this call to a simpler life. So that sounds what you're describing a bit more, the, the older you get, the more. Yeah. 
I, I think there's always a tension around it as well, because that's the space, space where we can be perhaps most ourselves, most relaxed and most authentic with other people, except so many of our spaces are nothing like that, or mine aren't. It's very busy, hard to connect. So it's how do I hang on to something of this? How do I take out from the beginning of the day where I might just for a moment connect and take that with me? You mentioned a sort of inspirational friend for the garden maybe that you want to grow. So a friend that's with you all the time or a friend that comes and tells you what to do? or Definitely not one that tells me what to come <laughs> do. They're not going to last too long, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, I think that's one of the great things about long-standing friendships, even when you're very busy, that yeah. you can just find those times, sit down, and, and and reconnect and that's 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 a fantastic thing and rediscover something with yeah. them or see it through their eyes again so I'm not sure if there's one special mm-hmm. person but there are a few people who would even help me build this I think we'll yeah. see Is there anything that we haven't mentioned that you would like us to No, uh, you've asked me questions I think which have opened things up which I've thought a lot about in, in connection with this but also brought things into the conversation I wasn't wasn't expecting to so Thank you. Thanks very much. The Lake Isle of Innisfree. I will arise and go now, and go to Innisfree, and a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean roads will I have there, a hive for the honeybee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there. For peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore, while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's grey. I hear it in the deep heart's core. That was Alistair Snell with the gift reading of the poem at the end. And our thanks again to Martin for the conversation and for agreeing to let us share it with you. We're off to run some more exchanges now, uh, but in the meantime, if you have been enjoying the podcast, please do press subscribe, tell your friends... And if you can spare the time to give us a review or a rating on iTunes, that would be great. We'll be back in a few weeks' time. But for now, thank you for listening.